I'm so glad all of you are here. We're really excited to hear Noah Stricker speak. He is a writer, a photographer, and a birder from Presswell, Oregon. Uh, Birding Without Borders was his 2015, uh, 2015, he traveled to 41 countries and saw 6,042 species of birds. And so I think this is great to He has books that he has published. He also has a book back there that you can buy afterwards. So, Noah Stricker. All right, well, good evening, everyone. Everyone can hear me just fine? Yes. Great, great. Well, uh, it's good to be here. I think we've been in communication for a couple of years trying to work out <laughs> scheduling for this particular talk, so I'm finally glad it worked out. Um, it gives me a break from the heat of the valley. I drove over from Eugene this afternoon, and it was 89 when I went through West Eugene. And by the time I got here, it was 55 and drizzling, so <laughs> much more comfortable. <laughs> Sounds like tomorrow morning, I might get out to see some marble murrelets as they fly out from the morning. So anyway, a good excuse to do some birding. But before that, and without too much further ado, I just want to tell you tonight a little story about a little birding adventure I went on in 2015. So if we could get the lights dimmed down a little bit. You know how when you travel to a foreign country, they usually give you this piece of paper right before you arrive. Looks something like this. <laughs> This is an immigration form. They usually hand it to you on the plane as you're coming in for a landing. Nobody ever has a pen to fill it out. Your jet lag fights break out at this point. And I've filled out a lot of these immigration forms over the years, and I can tell you that they're all pretty similar, and they all have a spot for occupation. <laughs> I don't know about all of you, but I kind of have a hard time sometimes describing myself and what I do in one word. So I've put all kinds of things on these forms over the years. For a long time I was just writing writer, which seemed to be a suitably vague term. And that was until in April of 2015, I arrived in the country of Jamaica. And I walked up to the immigration counter and the official looked me in the eye and he said, well, what kind of a writer are you? And I said, uh, I write books. And he said, what are your books about? And I said, birds. <laughs> and then his expression darkened. And he got very, very suspicious. And he started asking me all these searching questions about who I was and what I do. And finally ended up with, well, what are you doing in the country of Jamaica then? And I wanted to say, look, I have 27 hours to see all 29 endemic species of birds in the country of Jamaica. I'm on a round the world bird watching binge, trying to become the first person ever to see 5,000 species in one calendar year. That's half of all the birds on planet Earth. My friends are waiting outside on the curb. I gotta get out there, the seconds are ticking. Instead, I just said, I'm a tourist. <laughs> and he finally let me through with a big sigh of relief, but uh, I learned my lesson. So ever since then, on every single immigration form I have filled out, I have just written, Bird Man. <laughs> and nobody has ever said a word about it. <laughs> they saw the movie. <laughs> you remember this movie? How many people saw The Big Year when it came out? Yeah, great. Well, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it, an entertaining Hollywood movie about bird watchers starring Jack Black, Owen Wilson, and Steve Martin. This was based on a true story, actually, about three birders who did a big year just within the U.S. in 1998. And they were trying to see as many species of birds as they could in one calendar year. And the tradition of big years actually goes much farther back than that, even even back to the days of Roger Tory Peterson, the father of American ornithology in the 1950s, took this big trip across the U.S. with a British friend of his named James Fisher and ended up writing a book about it called 
Wild America, which I also highly recommend if you've never read. And in that book, Peterson made literally a minor footnote near the end at the bottom of a page in one of the last chapters that just said something like, asterisk, during the year of 1953, I saw 573 species of birds during my travels. And he didn't mean that as like throwing a gauntlet or anything, um, but other people read that story and they saw the footnote and they took it as a challenge and they said, oh, well, I bet I could see more birds than that in a year. That sounds like a fun adventure. And so big years have been escalating and escalating ever since in the intervening decades until today we've got people like this guy. His name is Olaf. He did a big year, again, within North America a couple of years ago, where he had to see every bird in the nude. <laughs> Not the bird, he had to be in the nude. And he, he had all these special rules about it. And he, he couldn't find the bird and then take his clothes off. He had to find it when he was naked. And uh, I don't know how he managed not to get arrested about 12 different times during the year, but he still ended up seeing almost 600 species, which has got to be some kind of monumental achievement. But in any case, this is where big years have got now these days. So, and yet... Nobody had ever really taken the concept of a big year and applied it to the whole planet. People have been doing big years in their backyards, their home cities, counties, states. If you're really crazy like Olaf, maybe a whole continent. But I thought it was interesting because looking at the world from a bird's perspective, birds are universal creatures. They don't need passports and visas to travel across borders. And so it doesn't really make sense to confine yourself to a particular political region when you're looking for what are ultimately the freest creatures on Earth. So I always kind of thought, well, somebody should do a big year on a bird's sense of scale and just take on the whole planet, even though that would be fairly ambitious. And I never really thought I would be the one to do it. <laughs> In fact, there was another precedent uh, in 2008, a British couple named Alan Davies and Ruth Miller did a bunch of birding in different countries around the world, and they ended up seeing 4,341 of the 10,000 or so bird species in the world during that year. So that became the official world big year record. I read their travelogue when it came out and um, was quite inspired by all of their adventures along the way. And also, kind of like all those other people that had read Wild America and Roger Tory Peterson's footnote 50 years ago, I thought, well, I could see more birds than that <laughs> if I really went for it. And, but still, I, I didn't think it would be me that, that took a shot at this record. In fact, I came to the big year through a much more circuitous route. And I suppose it started with a whole different adventure. In the summer of 2011, I set out to hike the entire... Pacific Crest Trail, all the way from the Mexican border through California, Oregon, and Washington up to Canada. And that's a whole other story, but it took me about four months of wandering in the woods to hike that trail. And when you spend four months literally wandering in the woods, mostly alone, your mind tends to wander too. And at some point, I started thinking about big years and, well, what would the ultimate strategy be for a worldwide big year? And um, it was kind of a fun hypothetical question to think about as I walked along. And this adventure also gave me a taste of what it takes to put a logistical, long-distance, endurance-style adventure together. And then, in 2014, <coughs> I wrote this book called The Thing with Feathers, which I have plenty of copies here. If you haven't got one yet, come see me after class and I'd be happy to sign one for you. <laughs> but it ended up doing quite well. For a book of essays about bird behavior, you're not really assuming that's going to be a bestseller, but it kind of was. It was on the New York Times bestseller list, very briefly, and was it was reviewed in the Economist, and the People Magazine, and the Wall Street Journal, and Newsweek, and it's now been translated into seven different languages. It just came out in Polish last week, which I thought was quite entertaining. And um, So anyway, after that happened, 
I turned around and I wrote a proposal and sent it off to the publisher and basically said, well, for my next book project, I want to go around the world and look at birds for a year. And Houghton Mifflin came back and they said, yep, we'll give you an advance for the book up front that will be enough to cover the whole trip if it's on a shoestring. And I went, oh crap. <laughs> now I actually have to do this. <laughs> so, I had about four and a half months to plan the whole thing before I got started. And I immediately started thinking about strategy and realized that although this was an international trip, I really wanted to make it as local as possible. And so, from the very beginning, I set two rules for myself. I said I had to see every bird with at least one other person, which incidentally would give me witnesses for all these birds that I was seeing. And all those people that I went birding with had to be locals living in the same country that I was visiting. So no international tour guides or uh, friends flying in or that kind of thing allowed. I really had to connect with the local people in all of these different places. <clears throat> so this, for instance, is just a group of some of the birders that took me out for one morning in northern Borneo uh, later on in the year. This tended to happen. I would email one person and very politely say, can I sleep on your couch for a few days and do you want to go birding? And they would reply and say yes, and when I landed there, they would have invited all of their friends to come along as well. So I had these big posses of birders with me in different places. I ended up going birding with hundreds of different people during the year. Then I started thinking about what to pack. I learned a few lessons from hiking the PCT about traveling light and decided to apply those lessons to this adventure as well. So, this is everything I took for a whole year of traveling the world. I got one 40 liter backpack from REI, about the same size as a school kid's backpack that you can slide under any airplane seat. So I would never have to check any luggage. And I told myself if it didn't fit, I don't need it. One thing I definitely did need was a spotting scope, so you can see it there on the bottom of the tripod, and that filled up about half my space and weight allowance. So there was just room around the edges for an extra pair of underwear and some malaria medication and some water purification tablets, and that silk thing is a silk sleeping bag liner that I could crawl inside and sleep just about anywhere. But other than that, I traveled very light. and. I suppose it's a truism of travel and many other things in life, I suppose, that the farther you go, the less you need to take with you along the way. One thing I definitely could not take was reference material. This is just a stack of the field guides covering the regions that I planned to visit during the year. And this was essentially my homework before I set out. I had to learn all these birds. And I ended up going painstakingly through each one of these books, and I either photographed or scanned the identification plates as digital files into my phone and onto my laptop. So I had this whole library with me in the field. I just didn't have to carry the heavy reference books, uh, which was great. It just meant that it took a couple of weeks of extra work to scan all that stuff. And then the fun part, well, you've got a year to travel the world. Where do you want to go? I started putting dots down on the map in my living room, like all my ultimate birding destinations, and then very quickly realized that a year might sound like a long time, but it is not very long at all if you're trying to cover the whole planet. So I had to kind of refine my strategy and focus on the places that would get me the most birds. In order to get to 5,000, which was my goal from the beginning, that meant I have to average about one new species of bird every waking hour for the entire year. So I had to go to the places with the highest diversity, which tend to be concentrated around the tropics. But also, I had to make sure that I hit enough places with a large number of endemic birds 
which tend to be islands and isolated mountain ranges, places like Jamaica or Madagascar or a mountain range in Colombia that has nothing around it, because there you can see birds that you won't find anywhere else. So it was a balance, really, between diversity and endemism to create the strategy. So this is the map I came up with, and I decided that I would do this as one continuous trip. No backtracking, no going back home during the year, it, may, it meant that I would be very efficient. I would just go from point to point. I started in the Western Hemisphere and worked my way east, basically. But it also meant that I could not hit places during the ideal migration season, in many <coughs> cases, which didn't end up being a big deal because <laughs> migrants tend to be common and widespread, so I would see them at one place or another along the way. But it also meant that I could not hit places necessarily at the ideal uh, season just in terms of rain. And so, for instance, I spent two weeks in West Africa during the height of the monsoon season when I saw not a single other foreigner the entire time. And uh, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> On January 1st, 2015, at midnight, I was on a ship off the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. I wanted to start this trip at the end of the world, partly so I could try to see a penguin as my first bird of the year. I almost made it. The chinstrap penguin was technically bird number four on January 1st. My first bird I glimpsed was a nice species of southern seabird called a Cape petrel. And then from there, I started to make my way north. And I feel like this is kind of how a lot of people see bird watching, especially this kind of bird watching, where you see a bird and you get a really good view of it and you get super excited and you check it out, maybe you take a picture of it and then you go, check, and then you turn around and walk off and forget all about it and move on to the next one. And, but if you just take one step back, you can see that <coughs> And it's not just about the bird, it's about the other people that are there with you enjoying this experience. And if you take another step back, you can see that it's about these amazing landscapes that the birds live in in different parts of the world. There are some penguins in this picture, for scale, right there. <laughs> it shows you how big that sea ice is in Antarctica. So I guess by starting in Antarctica, I, it was not necessarily the most strategic because there's only about 20 species on the entire continent of birds. I wanted to make this subtle statement right from the beginning that it wasn't for me just about the numbers. Yes, I was trying to get to 5,000 birds, but I also wanted to have these adventures. And so it was about the people and the languages and the foods and the, you know, just all of this other stuff that you embrace when you're traveling. However, when I left Antarctica, I still needed to see 4,990 more birds, so I hit the ground running in South America. My most wanted bird when I got to South America was one called the Harpy Eagle. Harpy Eagles are the most powerful raptor in the Western Hemisphere. They're about three feet tall, they fly around the rainforest in very remote areas and eat Monkeys and sloths is their main diet. They pick them off of treetops. They can carry a 20-pound howler monkey back to their nest, which is the size of a Volkswagen bus up in a tree, and tear it apart and feed it to their chicks. I really wanted to see a harpy eagle. So when I got to central Brazil, I met up with these two local birders, uh, Bianca and Juliano, brother and sister, who had volunteered to take me around for a few days. And when I landed, they met me at the airport, and they smiled, and they said, you will not believe it. And I said, what? And they said, we have staked out an active harpy eagle nest, and we're going to go there at dawn tomorrow, and we will definitely see one. And I, was, I couldn't hardly sleep at all that night. <laughs> we got up at dawn, went out, and spent five and a half hours staring at that nest that I just showed you, and nothing moved that entire time. I was so disappointed to miss my most wanted bird, and I was totally bummed out, but at the same time I was watching my watch going, well, you know, I 
there's another species I probably just missed by spending another hour here looking at this nest. How do you weigh these things against each other? Every bird technically counts the same, but a harpy eagle really isn't the same as the rest of them. So we went off and we had some lunch, and uh, Bianca said, well, why don't we just swing by the nest one more time on our way out? And so we did, and we spent another hour, and we were talking about, well, maybe the eggs failed, or maybe the nest is so big that the female is sitting inside it and we can't even see her up there, and we're having these arguments. And finally, of course, just as we stood up to leave, the male harpy eagle swooped in right over our heads with a half of a kawadi, this type of Amazonian raccoon-like animal, clutched in its talons. And it perched on a branch right in front of us, remarkably inconspicuously for such a huge raptor. Uh, can you see where it is there? It's, it's right there. If you zoom in a little bit, you get a little better view. We've got this amazing crest on top of their head. Um, this one is on the a kill right there. I don't know if you can see there's a banded tail hanging down right there. That's the, the kawadi that it's eating. Their legs are as thick as your wrist. Their feet, if they spread them out, are as big around as a dinner plate. Their talons are longer than a grizzly bear's claws. So, yes, the harpy eagle definitely went down on my list. This is one of the top birds of the year. The 30th of January. On Valentine's Day, I got higher than I've ever been in my entire life. This is in central Peru at a place called Ticlio Pass at 16,000 feet above sea level. And I had started that same morning in Lima at sea level. So when this photo was taken, I had a pretty killer altitude headache and stomach ache, and I was not feeling my best. But it was totally worth it because the birds in central Peru are incredible. And I spent the next couple of weeks birding around that area with this gentleman, whose name is Gunnar, uh, rhymes roughly with Lunar. He's a Swedish birder who moved to Lima, Peru several decades ago when it was pretty sketchy to move to Peru. And both just because he wanted to see the birds there, and he's flourished ever since, tracking down every last bird in the country of Peru. When I first contacted Gunnar and explained the project and everything, he emailed right back, in all caps, one sentence, that just said, I am your man. <laughs> exclamation points behind it. And when I landed, I realized that he always wears a hat that's embroidered across the front in all caps, more birds. <laughs> so, I think he probably was my man at that point. And we had some adventures together. We went off into the rainforest, and first it rained torrentially on us for several days because it was the wet season. Then I got a case of chiggers all over my feet that was super itchy. And then a bus collided with a tractor on the highway we were trying to get down at the same time, incidentally, that I came down with the flu. And then another bus got stuck on a bridge, and that held us up for a while. Then we got a dead battery in the middle of nowhere in a rainstorm on the edge of a cliff and had to work things out. And then we had a flat tire, and we got stuck on the bottom a couple of times. And then there was a landslide. And then there was another landslide that took out the road for like half a day, and we couldn't even get to the highlands because of an agricultural worker strike. And... Anyway. We made it to this particular patch of elfin cloud forest in central Peru, which was hard to get to. It was about 13,000 feet. And to get there, we had to leave our accommodations at 2 o'clock in the morning, take this horrendous one-lane dirt road hacked into the side of a mountain to get to the top by dawn to see one particular species of bird <laughs> called the golden-backed mountain tanager. The golden-backed mountain tanager is super endemic. You can only see it essentially in the forest that's within the frame of this photo. Um, it's known from only one or two sites in central Peru. And so, Gunnar and I walked into this forest at dawn, and within about an hour, there was the golden-backed mountain tanager. It wasn't even that hard to find after all that. Um, 
really cool bird. Bright yellow with these black wings. I can't, I don't know if you can see, there's blue on the top of the head and it has these fine black streaks. And so I was super stoked to add the golden back mountain tanager because hardly any people have ever seen this bird before because it so, lives in such a remote area. So that went down technically as bird number 1126 on the 17th of February, but the saga of the golden-backed mountain tanager wasn't quite over yet, as it turned out, because when Gunnar and I walked back after seeing that bird to our van, it turned out he had parked it in the ditch at the top of the mountain and got it stuck in the mud. And so I walked around to the back of the van with a sigh and got in position to push it out as I'd become accustomed to over the previous couple of weeks. And Gunnar got in the driver's seat to drive it out and he turned the key and then he stuck his head out the window and he said, well, I think we've got another dead battery here too. And so I walked up the right side of the van to confer with him and just happened to look down and noticed that not one but both right tires were completely flat, apparently from rock punctures on that terrible road we'd driven up in the dark that morning. So I'm stuck in the mud with a dead battery and two flat tires. I said, Gunnar, I don't think we're going to drive out of this one. I think we probably just need to start walking at this point. And he kind of nodded and said, yeah, you're probably right. So. I was fine because I had my little backpack and I just put it on and started walking down the mountain. No idea how many miles we'd have to go before we found help. Incidentally, we did have a plane to catch that same afternoon if we could make it out in time. And Gunnar, meanwhile, had two airport wheelie bags, one in each hand, dangling from his arms as we started walking down the mountain. And we went a couple of miles that way before. We finally came around the corner and we ran into a group of Andean potato farmers, a bunch of teenagers sitting around, who looked up what the expressions one might assume a group of Andean potato farmers would have upon seeing a couple of gringo looking gentlemen walking down their mountain carrying airport luggage in the hand. The cooter did not miss a beat. He put down one of his bags and he unzipped it to show that it was completely stuffed full of fresh oranges. And I just started laughing. I said, Gunnar, that must weigh 35 pounds. Were you going to carry that bag all the way down the mountain? And he said, yeah, but watch this. And he started tossing the oranges out to each of these farmers, whose expressions then lit up. And we instantly all sat down and had an orange-eating powwow very happily. And then they stood up and they said, well, okay. Who wants a ride down to the bottom of the mountain on the back of our dirt bikes? <laughs> we made it down just in time to catch a taxi to get to the airport and have the gate attendant look us in the eye and smile and say, your flight has been canceled. <laughs> I made a pilgrimage to Northwest Ecuador to pay a visit to a legend, literally an angel of peace. This man's name is Angel Paz, which literally means an angel of peace. And he has quite a story. According to legend, Angel, in a previous life, was a logger who was cutting down his trees. He owns a large property in the cloud forest. When one day, a group of bird watchers stopped by and they asked him, do you know where we can find some Andean cocks of the rock? This type of very brilliant orange bird that displays in weird courtship displays. And Angel said, oh, you mean those red birds? Yeah, I got some back here. I can show them to you if you want. And so they walked that direction. But as they were walking through his woods, a little brown bird hopped out of the undergrowth at their feet. And the birders looked at it, and they stopped dead, and they said, on hell, forget about the cocks of the rock. If you can show this little brown bird to visitors, they will actually pay you to see it. So they went on their way very happily. And meanwhile, on hell kind of scratched his head and said, well, 
I know that bird. It follows me around in the forest when I'm cutting down my trees. It seems to like eating the worms that get disturbed when I'm vlogging. I even nicknamed it. I call it Maria. So he got it into his head that maybe he could tame Maria and use that as a tourist attraction. And so every day he would go out and, and try to make friends with this little brown bird. When I arrived in 2015, I met Angel and we went out into his forest. He had a little leaf packet with worms on it that he put down on a post in a particular spot. And then he put his hands around his mouth and he went, Maria, Maria, venga, venga, venga. And sure enough, like 20 seconds later, this little brown bird hopped out of the undergrowth right into the trail. This is called a giant ant pitta. It is basically the only place in the world you can go to see a giant ant pitta. They are so rare and so skulky. But Angel has taught this one how to come in for its worms every morning. So rain or shine, bird or no, he goes out at 7 o'clock in the morning and feeds Maria her daily worms. And he's kind of refined his act over the past several years. So after we paid our respects to Maria, then we went a little farther and Angel did the same thing with the yellow-breasted ant pitta. And then he did the same thing with a chestnut-crowned ant pitta that came in for its worms. And then he did the same thing with another ant pitta called the ochre-breasted ant pitta, which is tiny. It's about the size and shape of an egg on legs. This one was my personal favorite, partly because Angel has his own name. He doesn't speak English. He's nicknamed all these birds himself. This one he likes to call Shakira. <laughs> it has this unique habit of twitching its chest from side to side when it gets excited. <laughs> In any case, he's done very well for himself with this whole ant pitta feeding operation. When I showed up, he had just built himself and his family this brand new, beautiful house in the cloud forest. Two stories, extra rooms upstairs with hand-carved ant pitta artwork in the walls and places for birders to stay. So I was one of the first people who got to stay on his property overnight. He is visited now by 2,500 birders per year, and every single one of them pays an entry fee. So it's this kind of amazing example of a conservation success story where a local man has found that rather than cutting down his forest, he can make a much better living by keeping it intact. I spent about five months just in Latin America because there's so many birds in South and Central America and I wound up in northern Mexico in mid-May. This is the interior state of Durango, hot and rugged. I was out here at about 10 p.m. one evening with another birder named Rene, who lived in the nearby city of Monterey. And we found this type of nocturnal bird with a spotlight. Now, I'd heard you can do this before with night jars, this type of bird, but I'd never tried it. Apparently, if you aim the spotlight at the bird, it kind of freezes like a deer in the headlights, and if you gradually get closer and closer, it won't fly away, which was very useful in this case because there's actually a couple different species of night jars in that part of Mexico that are similar to each other, and I wasn't <laughs> sure which one it was. So I got it very close, and I held up my phone next to the bird, carrying <laughs> a field guide app with the actual bird, and uh, finally figured out that this bird was, in fact, a common poor will, just like we have here in Eastern Oregon, so I've seen many, many common poor wills in my life. But this particular poor will was a special one, because first of all, I reached out my hand and I very tenderly stroked the back of the bird's head several times and it didn't even move. And then, as I backed off and turned the flashlight off and the bird collected its senses and flew away, I realized that this common poor will was my 2500th bird of the year on the date of May 16th, which meant that I was ahead of schedule. If I kept this pace up, I might even see more than 5,000 birds by the end of the year. But 
I knew that I still had a long ways to go yet. So I passed through the U.S. in late May just for a few days. I didn't spend long. I spent two days in South Texas, two days in Southeast Arizona, one day in Los Angeles, a couple days here at home in Oregon uh, so I could go birding and so that I could get myself a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> and continued on my way. My last stop in the U.S. was in New York State where I went birding for a day with this guy whose name is Tim Lenz. Tim is a programmer for the website eBird, which is what I was using to keep my sightings in order. You submit your sightings and it uh, goes into a big database with all the other birder sightings in the world. eBird is very cool. But Tim had volunteered to show me the local common stuff that I was still missing for my big year list. So we were tooling around looking at these amazing common local species like the upland sandpiper and some other birds. And I think we were out that afternoon looking particularly for American black ducks, which is the northeast version of a mallard. It's super common in New York State during the summer. When suddenly, Tim got a WhatsApp message on his cell phone, and he started vibrating instead of the phone. And I said, Tim, what is it? What is it? And he said, you are not going to believe this. And I said, what? And he said, a brown pelican has just been reported from Cayuga Lake. Do you realize this is like the first inland record ever of a brown pelican in the state of New York? We have to go see this bird right now. And I said, okay, okay, Tim, that, that's awesome. You realize I just saw like 2,000 brown pelicans last week in California, though. <laughs> I don't need to see a brown pelican for my big year. But I knew the feeling, because whenever something unusual gets reported around here in Oregon, I'm the first one out the door to try to go see it. So we compromised on a detour, and it was great. The WhatsApp group messages were coming in from other birders in the field up to the second with uh, trajectory and velocity. So we could put ourselves ahead of where the pelican was, and we got to a particular marina just in time and waited approximately two minutes, and then Sure enough, this super rare brown pelican <laughs> swooped over our heads, and I got to see it, and we even got a photo. And then the WhatsApp messages continued as it went on over downtown Ithaca. Uh, people were saying things like, it's over the farmer's market right now. I just ran out of class and ditched my professor, and it's flying over my hall going east, and it's gaining altitude. And finally it swooped off, and um, I don't know if it hung around after that. but. I thought this was great, and then we could go back to looking for black ducks afterward. <laughs> kind of interesting, though, is an illustration of big year strategy and how if you do a big year on any smaller scale, even the whole U.S., your strategy is totally dependent on finding rare birds like this that blow in from other places that aren't necessarily supposed to be there. Because, say, you're in the U.S., and a Siberian thrush blows into Alaska, you have to take the next plane to Alaska to try to see that one individual thrush before it can go back to Siberia and you can't count it anymore. But if you just do the whole planet, then it totally flips that on its head because you don't get rewarded at all for looking at rare birds like this. In fact, the strategy becomes about finding the most common birds in the places where they're actually supposed to be which I actually thought was pretty cool. So I tried to leave New York. Uh, good old United Airlines uh, <laughs> delayed me by about 27 hours getting out of New York City. My worst airline snafu of the year. And unfortunately, my next planned layover was in Iceland. I had planned just over a day in Iceland as a layover between New York and Norway before I left the Western Hemisphere behind entirely. And when the dust settled, my new itinerary had me landing in Reykjavik at midnight and then taking off again for Oslo at 7 o'clock a.m. So I was like, well, there goes Iceland. Thanks, United. But then I realized it was June. It does not get dark in Iceland during the summer. So I called up my local contact there and I said, look, here's what happened. Here's my new schedule. 
Uh, don't worry, I'll just find a taxi or I'll walk around the airport or something and see whatever birds I can. But if you want to, <laughs> and you're interested in pulling an all-nighter with me, and he didn't even hesitate, he said, sure, I'll pick you up at midnight, sounds like an adventure. And so I came down in Reykjavik, and sure enough, this guy Jan and I birded around the outskirts of the city for several hours, and we saw all kinds of birds. At 3 o'clock in the morning, we were out at this remote cliff looking at Atlantic puffins, and at 4 o'clock in the morning, we were seeing whooper swans, and 5 o'clock in the morning, we got this godwit on a pond, and 6 o'clock in the morning, we had... I think this is three new birds at once, actually. Yeah, gray lag goose, arctic tern, and black-headed gull. I saw 54 species of birds by the time we got to our last stop at uh, just after 6 o'clock a.m. This little lagoon, which incidentally happened to be right in front of the Icelandic presidential palace. And I could just imagine the president in there sleeping as this photo was taken, probably dreaming about his amazing yard list. <laughs> but I turned to him and I said, thanks so much for staying up with me all night. I hope you can drop me off now and at least go get some sleep. And he said, well, kind of. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well... I don't really live in Reykjavik. And I said, what do you mean? Where do you live? And he said, well, I actually live in northern Iceland, and I had to drive for five hours to come meet you at the airport. And then we were birding for a few hours, and now I'm going to try to sleep about an hour and a half in my truck before I have to turn around and drive five hours back home because I have to go back to work today. <laughs> This is the kind of generosity that people will come up with when you have a passionate project. And I ran into this kind of thing over and over again throughout the year, and it just completely blew me away every time. So, I caught my connection, and I landed in Oslo after not having slept for about three straight days. And in the Oslo Cemetery, which is incidentally a pretty good birding spot, I met my <laughs> next contact named Bjorn, which means bear in Norwegian apparently, and Bjorn had volunteered to take me around central Norway for the next four days. Um, it doesn't really get dark in Norway either at that time of year, and it was kind of like swapping in fresh horses. Bjorn was perfectly well rested, and he was not allowed to let me miss any birds on his watch in his territory, and so his plan for the next four days was we would jump in his car and we'd drive all over north, central Norway and see these amazing birds, like uh, nesting Lapland longspurs, which are even kind of familiar from around here sometimes on the Oregon coast, before we literally could not stay awake anymore. And then he just brought along a couple of sleeping bags and pads, and we'd throw those down on the ground because you're allowed to camp anywhere you want in Norway, as long as you're not on someone's back lawn. Um, and sleep a couple of hours, get up at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, and keep going, maybe take a short nap in the afternoon as well. And so we did that for the next four days, and then I was about ready to say, I need to go to a country where it gets dark. <laughs> I'm going to die. <laughs> but it was actually kind of cool to be camping out like this, because when I started the big year, I had started a blog on the National Audubon Society's website called Birding Without Borders that people started following along and wrote daily entries. But when I started the blog, Audubon sent a photographer to my house outside of Eugene to take a photo to illustrate the landing page of the blog. And this was the picture that he came up with. So. This photo is totally fake, okay? I'm sitting there reading a copy of my own book in a sleeping bag, <laughs> spotlighting an owl up there that's actually a plastic owl that's been nailed to the top of that tree, and it's lit with floodlights and everything, and this photographer was very proud of it. He'd sketched it out in his notebook before even arriving at my house and everything, and so this was the photo they used. I'd been looking at this picture every day for the whole year and thought it was very funny. But then, on the third day in Norway, just at dusk, Bjorn and I, in our haze of sleep deprivation, put down our sleeping bag on the side of a forest road, 
and crawled in, and just as I was starting to pass out, we heard a tawny owl calling nearby. And so Bjorn got out his phone and he played a snippet of a tawny owl call, and the thing flew right in and landed in a tree right over our head, right there. That little speck is actually the owl with Bjorn in a sleeping bag aiming his flashlight at it. So that fake blog photo actually ended up coming true. <laughs> I didn't spend much time at all in Europe. I was only in Europe for just over a week total. There's not that many bird species in Europe. The same could really be said for the US and Australia. Most species are in the other three main continents. And then I dropped down into Africa for the next two and a half months. And for me personally, Africa was the only continent I had never visited before. And so it was probably the most exotic to my own experience. And the landscape changed, and the people and the cultures changed, obviously. And the wildlife changed pretty dramatically as well, especially in South and East Africa. There's all these other animals that are <laughs> super awesome, but they don't have feathers, and so they were kind of distracting being out on safari when I was trying to look for these little brown birds all the time, and these other creatures kept walking past. Um, it was really cool to see stuff like lions, and we had some amazing looks at leopards in Kruger National Park in South Africa, and a hunting cheetah as well in the Serengeti in Tanzania. But I was still birding, so when people were looking, you know, at the African elephant at a water hole, I was the one that was more focused on the African fish eagle perched over the elephant's head. And when people were watching the buffalo coming toward us, I was checking out the ox pecker sitting on the buffalo's back, very happily so. And sometimes the birds in Africa will use the other animals as habitat, like this javan on top of the hippo's head in Uganda. And the birds themselves in Africa can stop traffic sometimes in their own right. This is called a southern ground hornbill crossing the street, again, in Kruger National Park in South Africa. And there's these big storks that like to hang around the campgrounds and actually make quite a nuisance of themselves because they try to steal all your food all the time. <laughs> But I started noticing a trend. Birding, especially in these safari regions in Africa, you'd be out in your open land cruiser with a couple other birders, and you'd find something amazing like this giant kingfisher perch next to the side of the road and stop and start checking it out and have your binoculars up and be drinking in these good views and taking photos. And after a minute, you'd turn around and there'd be like 15 other safari trucks parked bumper to bumper right behind you, all of them wanting to know where the lion was that you were so obviously excited about. And when they realized that you were bird watching, there would be these expressions of disappointment and almost disgust as people would drive off in a cloud of dust. And so we came up with a solution to this problem. We had a copy of the paper field guide with a big picture of a bird on the cover. And whenever anybody parked right behind us, we'd roll down the window and wave it out the window and they'd see it and they'd take the hint and realize we were birders and leave us alone. We called that maneuver flipping them the bird. <laughs> From Africa, I moved on into Asia, and things changed again dramatically. I was impressed in Africa with all of their spectacular national parks, and they were all full of people, but for the most part, all of the people visiting the parks in Africa were foreigners. There were hardly any locals in their own reserves, which of course there's all kinds of reasons for that, but when I got to Asia, and India was my next stop, <coughs> that completely switched. So again, there were these dramatic national parks, and again, they were full of people, but the people I met there were almost entirely locals with hardly any foreigners visiting. And so it was quite refreshing to spend the next several weeks birding around India and other parts of Asia, again, with these big posses of bird watchers. India, in particular, has quite a bird watching 
uh, subculture now, there's probably, just by sheer population, just about as many birders in India as even in the United States these days. I didn't even quite realize that before I got there and started meeting some of these birders. There's even young birders in India. The guy on the left is named Raman. He's 24 years old. The one on the right is named Tosh. He's 14 years old. And identifying all the birds and the bird sounds that we heard just as well as the best established experts as far as I could tell. So I felt like the future of birding is in good hands in some of these places. And it was in southern India that I came across this bird. Can you see the bird in this picture? There's actually two. There's one beak and a tail there and another beak there and another tail there. This is called a Sri Lanka frog mouth. It's a type of nocturnal bird that lives in southern India and Sri Lanka. And the Sri Lanka frog mouth, as it happened, was bird number 4,342, which meant that on September 16th, they had officially passed the existing big year world record. Which, to be honest, I hadn't even really been thinking about that much. I hadn't seen this project as trying to beat somebody else's mark, and my own personal goal was to get to 5,000. But I have to admit that it was pretty cool to break a world record in the country of India, because there's something about Indian people, some huge disproportionate number of Guinness Book of World Records submissions come from the country of India. They have their own book, the Indian Book of Records, and there's even a third one apparently called the Linka Book of Records, and they were overjoyed that somebody was breaking a world record on their turf. And so it wasn't just me out there with the frog mouths. They had brought in um, uh, TV crews and reporters and people to interview me. The next morning, I walked down a random street in a small town and looked at a newspaper stand, and I saw a picture of myself on the front page of the Times of India, the world's largest English-language newspaper, staring back at me, which was quite an experience. Um, in fact, this guy drove 150 kilometers just to come shake my hand that afternoon. He was a real religious bishop, pretty high up in the ranking, I, I gather, in India. And he shook my hand and he said, I had a feeling you would break the record today. <laughs> and I said, great, but are you a birder? Are you interested in birds? And he said, I have an interest in all living things. <laughs> I said, great, I just love the enthusiasm. Um, just so many birders, so many people really respecting the outdoors and their natural world. And that continued even as I continued on my way to other parts of Asia. So for instance, in Taiwan, again, I met big groups of birders and traveled with them around the country of Taiwan for a few days. And in Taiwan, these birders took me to see a local celebrity. We went to see, in a farm field outside of Taipei, this bird called a Siberian crane. This was actually the first individual Siberian crane ever recorded in the country of Taiwan. And we didn't find it. It had been there for about eight months before I arrived. And in fact, virtually the entire country knew about this bird. The Taiwanese called it the little white crane. And it was a legitimate celebrity. We showed up there at on a Tuesday afternoon, eight months after this bird had been there, every single day in the same farm field next to a busy highway outside of Taipei where you could get right up next to it. And there were these barriers set up to keep you from going out into the field. The crane is pacing back and forth out there just like it had been doing every day. And they'd set up banners translated into English about the cranes and don't you know, get in its way. The, the government had assigned this bird its own 24-hour security guard to make sure that nothing <laughs> could befall it, because it was seen as this immaculate ambassador of Taiwanese-Siberian relations and um, international diplomacy and all this stuff. And so they went a little crazy about it. They'd set up souvenir stands with cream-themed knickknacks along the side of the road, and there were dozens and dozens of people lined up. Again, months and months after the bird had first been spotted there. They didn't quite know what to do with this crane, though, because 
It had obviously gone off course. Cranes learn how to migrate from their parents. Siberian cranes are super endangered. There's only about 1,200 individuals left, and they're supposed to winter in central China. So this one had gone astray and didn't know how to make it back home. People were saying, well, maybe we can recapture it and transport it back to China so it can rejoin its flock. Can we do that with the international regulations about transport of birds with avian flu and that kind of stuff? Should we mess with nature? Should we not? Should we just leave it alone and make it make up its mind on its own? It didn't really matter in the end because shortly after I saw it, this crane was observed one morning to get up and fly all on its own out of the field. That same evening it was relocated huddling, taking shelter in an urban subway station in metropolitan Taipei while news trucks filmed its every move. And then the following morning it woke up again and it flew and it flew out to sea. And to this day, nobody knows whether it was able to rejoin its flock somewhere along the migration route or whether this crane just decided to take a path all of its own. Near the end of the year, I stopped in Papua New Guinea. New Guinea for bird watchers is basically synonymous with birds of paradise. Ever since David Attenborough did his series Attenborough in Paradise, people have gone crazy about these birds. There's about 41 species of them, pretty much all in New Guinea. A lot of them live in the Central Highlands. So I made my way up to the Central Highlands and spent a couple of days frolicking with these king of Saxony, bird of paradise, and those plumes actually attach right above the bird's eye, and it can move them even a little independently, almost like these weird antennas. Super strange birds, weird noises, strange courtship dances, all the rest. But then, I did something a little bit different, because a couple of months before, a local man on a different island in New Guinea called New Britain had found a rare bird that I really wanted to see. So at the last minute, I changed my plane ticket, and instead of flying straight down to Australia, I went to the island of New Britain for a couple of days. And I gotta say, going from the lush, impenetrable, raw highlands of central New Guinea to the lowlands of this island called New Britain was a bit of a shock because this is mostly what New Britain looks like. It's mostly owned by one company called New Britain Palm Oil Limited. If you know anything about palm oil, it's yes. ubiquitous. It's in more than 50% of all supermarket products. Like it or not, you've probably eaten palm oil today. You've probably washed with it. It's in shampoo and soap and chocolate and deodorant and all kinds of stuff. It's not even necessarily labeled as palm oil on the package. It goes by all kinds of different weird names. <coughs> Anyway, it's super cheap and very lucrative for people in the tropics to grow in a plantation, and so it's led to a lot of habitat destruction in lowland areas in the tropics. And I'd seen palm oil plantations like this in other places, but hadn't really been immersed in one the way that I found myself on the island of New Britain. And it was interesting to, just to see how they process the clumps of nuts and then each individual one gets squeezed down and creates the oil, which then gets exported to other places and they put it in products. Um, so that's its own kind of conservation issue. But I went birding with this local man named Joseph, who worked actually at a dive resort on New Britain. Birders don't really go there, but it's very popular for diving because it's in the so-called coral triangle and super diverse. And he'd been out a couple of days before with a group of tourists trying to show them fireflies one evening. They drove from the resort just about a half mile into a palm oil plantation when something flew across the beams of his headlights and landed on a post. And he put his flashlight on it and he went, oh my gosh, that is a golden masked owl, a bird that had not been seen alive in approximately 30 years. So he uploaded a video of this owl on YouTube. I saw the video. I changed my plane ticket to go to New Britain. And the first evening I was there, Joseph took me out into the palm oil plantation, 
Just like the Golden Back Mountain Tanager, it wasn't even really that hard to find. We spent about half an hour before, sure enough, there it was, sitting on a palm frond in our spotlight. Kind of looks like a barn owl, although it has some slight plumage differences and sounds different. It's endemic to that one island, as far as anybody can tell. I've got to say, this was about the weirdest place to find what would be the rarest bird of the year. This is definitely not an endorsement of palm oil plantations as rare bird habitat, <laughs> but maybe that's why it was overlooked for so long, because people didn't even bother to look for birds in this area. And so it was probably surviving by roosting in the adjacent forest and coming into the plantations at night to hunt in the open spaces where it could find certain rodents that they like to eat. Anyway. Quite an interesting experience, and I was very lucky to become one of the first people to see this bird since before I was even born. <laughs> I dropped down into New Zealand in December, and I spent two days in Auckland, birding around the North Island. If you ever go to Auckland, do yourself a favor and take the ferry that goes from downtown to this island. This is called Tiri Tiri Matangi Island. It's very easy to get to. You can spend a half a day or even a full day walking around before coming back to Auckland. And Tiri Tiri Matangi Island is pretty special because decades ago, the New Zealand government decided that they would use it as a sanctuary. So they got rid of all the introduced cats and rats on the island, which is only a couple kilometers across. After that was done, the island had mostly been cleared of vegetation, so they painstakingly planted hundreds of thousands of trees and native plants, literally regrew the forest. So this is what it looks like today, quite lush and beautiful, with trails winding through the woods. And now they are gradually reintroducing the endemic species of birds they could not survive there or on the mainland because of the introduced predators. And so Tiri Tiri Matangi is now one of the only places that you can go and see in the wild, free flying on their own, nesting, birds like the New Zealand robin, the New Zealand stitch bird, which is now technically classified in its own family, it's so unique, and the bird called the kokako, which I think there's only a few dozen individuals left still, but you can see them again on Tiri Tiri Matangi in the wild. I could count them for my big year because they're self-sustaining, um, but more to the point, it was just a very cool, again, example of a conservation success <coughs> story, and Tiri Tiri Matangi has now become a model for other places in New Zealand and even other parts of the world where people are saying, well, okay, if we cannot conserve everything, then at least we can find these patches where birds can be safe and uh, be protected. My last country of the year was Australia. I landed in Northeast Australia in the town of Cairns, spent a couple days birding around, and I was met on that first morning by a local reporter from the Cairns Post newspaper who asked me all these questions. One of his questions was, what bird do you most want to see in Australia? And I said, well, I'd really like to see a cassowary. And he kind of nodded and said, oh, okay, and he wrote it down. The next morning, his article came out, and the headline was, Birdwatcher wants to break world record with the cassowary in Cairns. <laughs> and I said, well, kind of. I would really like to see a cassowary, though. A couple hours later that morning, I got a phone call from a local guy who said, hey, I read the paper this morning. Have you seen one of those cassowaries yet? And I said, no, do you know where I might find one? And he said, well, sure, I've got a cass and two chicks like to hang out around my backyard. I just saw them a couple minutes ago. And I said, hold it right there. And uh, immediately drove to the spot, which turned out to be in this nice uh, property in the wet forest above Cairns. And sure enough, spent a whole half hour or hour hanging out with this male cassowary and two young chicks. It's always the father that takes care of the young and the cassowary, one of the most primitive birds in the world. You can just see how it looks like a dinosaur. 
These birds have the somewhat dubious reputation as being the most dangerous bird in the world, because as far as I know, they're the only bird that's ever directly killed a human being through blunt force trauma. If they kick you hard enough in the stomach, it can actually disembowel you. But these ones were super friendly, and it was really nice to hang out with these cassowaries. So, again, definitely one of the top birds of the year. That bird is probably just as tall as I am, more or less. So they are quite large. I think they're the third biggest after the ostrich and the emu. Least Christmassy Christmas I've ever spent in my whole life in the interior of Southwest Australia, a couple hundred miles from Perth. I spent December 25th in 95 degree heat all day. This was the only Christmas tree I saw that particular day. I was kind of worried, actually, that I'd find a birder crazy enough to spend his whole holiday birding with me in the middle of nowhere. But me to worry, I found this guy named Frank in Perth, and we drove out to this place called Payne's Find and spent the day. <coughs> but of course, if you're creative enough, any tree can be a Christmas tree. So this one had a green and red bird in it, which was called a Molga parrot. And the Molga parrot on December 25th was bird number 5,959. So that evening, I said, Frank, I've got to find, what, 41 more birds? <laughs> I can't come this close to 6,000 and not get there. That would be criminal. How am I going to do this? So we spent hours into the night that evening on Christmas Day painstakingly making a list of every last bird in Australia that I could still see that would be new for the year. And we finally calculated that it was not possible. <laughs> Maybe if I had several weeks. Australia is a big place, and there were all these remote birds one by one, but I didn't have that time to go track them all down. So I said, well, Frank, it's been great birding with you, but uh, where in the world can I go back to that I could get 41 more birds? I've only got one shot at this. So I used, again, that website eBird, which had all of my data in it, and it has a feature where it will filter your sightings against what other people have seen in any given region and spit out a target list in order of abundance or frequency. So I can literally calculate possibilities for different places. And I figured out mathematically the one spot I could go back to that I probably should have gone to the first time around but hadn't was the far northeast corner of... India, way up there in the Assam province, up by the Chinese-Burmese border. So, some fancy footwork with visas and booking flights on Christmas Day internationally. Uh, found myself, less than 48 hours later, at 8,000 feet in the Himalayas, in the middle of nowhere in northeast India, birding with, again, these gung-ho young Indian birders. That's the same guy on the right, Ramon. He called up a couple more friends. He knew in the Northeast, and we went hard right up until New Year because we knew we had to get every last bird. One of our highlights was this bird. <laughs> Can you see a bird in this picture? It's there. I swear, there's a bird right there. <laughs> Terrible picture of a really good bird. This is called a yellow rumped honey guide. Only found in a narrow altitudinal range in the Himalaya in northeast India alongside vertical rock faces that have an active honeybee hive attached. So, quite a specific habitat for the yellow rumped honey guide. And I was so excited to see it, I was literally jumping up and down in the middle of the road because the Yellow Rum Honey Guide on December 29th was <laughs> Of course, I still had two days left, so I didn't stop. As it happened, my very last bird of the year on the 31st of December was this one. 
a little owl called an Oriental Bay Owl at about 11 p.m. that evening. Technically not even a new species for the year because I'd seen one in Borneo a couple months earlier, but when I took this picture, Ramit turned to me and he said, do you realize how rare this owl is in India? And I said, no, what do you mean? And he said, to my knowledge, this is the first photograph ever taken of an oriental bay owl in this country. And I said, okay, the big year is done. <laughs> In the end, I visited 41 countries during the year. I flew almost exactly 100,000 miles. It worked out to 100,514 miles to be precise, which might sound like a lot. It's about the same as four round trips from New York to Southwest Australia. So I didn't really spend that much time in airports and on planes during the year because it averaged out to maybe one flight every three or four days and each one was only an hour or two. I was never jet lagged the entire time and I scheduled most of those travel, day, travel times in the evening and at night so I could preserve my precious daylight hours for looking at birds. So that didn't really eat into my schedule hardly at all, which was sort of a surprise. I spent just about exactly $60,000 on the whole trip. All expenses included, all the plane tickets, travel, accommodation, food, gear and equipment, everything. Um, which again, it might sound like a lot, might sound like not so much. For me, $10 per bird seemed like a pretty small price to pay <laughs> for this adventure. And I guess it just goes to show that Traveling, like many other things in life, is a priority, and we make these choices every day. Would you rather have a nice new SUV in your garage at home, or would you rather go to 41 different countries? It really is that simple when you break it down, even if you don't realize that you're making these decisions. I saw a ton of birds, and I knew from the beginning that I would, and was quite excited about it, but in the end, I suppose the number I ended up with 6,042 species at the end, was a little more fleeting than even I had first imagined. Partly because when I finished my year on January 1st, 2016, a young Dutch man, about two months younger than me, named Arjan, set out on his own round the world bird watching adventure, partly I think inspired by this one. And he learned from some of my mistakes and made some tweaks here and there, visited almost all of the same places, and he even saw a couple hundred more birds than I did. So right away, within a year, my world record was broken. I am no longer a world record big year holder, which I guess is for the best. World records are made to be beaten, and I wish him all the best and everything else. Also, scientists keep changing the number of birds there are in the world. So the global bird list has been inflating by about 1% per year for the past decade or so, quite consistently each year. There's now about 10,500 species recognized, but just this past year, some researchers wrote a paper where they tried to estimate, according to new DNA methods, applying those to birds worldwide, how many species they think there should be. And they said they think there should actually be 18,000 bird species in the world. So the splitting is not going to stop anytime soon. I can sit at home in my armchair for the rest of my life and keep getting life birds every single year as the list keeps going up. So even the, the number of birds themselves has been changing. And I think what I was left with more than anything, of course, in the end, was this whole network of birders and new friends and acquaintances and contacts and people I had met along the way. And the most lasting impressions that I have from this adventure were all the adventures that we went on together. And while I was keeping the Birding Without Borders blog, initially I started it basically as a way to tell my mom that I wasn't quite dead yet. <laughs> and, uh, People started following it, and it built up this amazing... Uh, uh, people got very interested in a way that I hadn't quite anticipated, and by the end it was getting tens of thousands of views 
every day. And so if I can spread a little bit of that birdie inspiration, I suppose that's the best possible result from this adventure. So this past year, I have been back at home in Oregon. I have just finished writing a book about this whole thing. It's called Birding Without Borders. It will be published by Houghton Mifflin sometime this fall, probably in October. And meanwhile, on to more adventures. Thank you so much for having me. bird and cannot see it, does that count? Good question. Do herd-only birds count? Yes, in fact. Uh, about 330 of the 6,042 birds I recorded were by ear alone. Birds are as distinctive in their sounds as they are visually. Um, in fact, I spent so much time listening to birds during the year because I could count them if I heard them, that when I got back home, one of the first things I did was I bought myself a nice parabolic dish and a good recording unit, and I've been going around recording all the birds in my own backyard and relearning uh, even my own common species in ways that I hadn't thought possible before. The first bird I pointed it at was a Stellar's Jay that was sitting quietly on a branch, and a parabolic dish amplifies bird sound. When I put on my headphones, I realized that this Jay was sitting there very quietly singing a whisper song to itself. And that just totally changed my view of what birds are doing and saying out there. So yes, I, birds count if they're heard only, and that's a whole nother world. For what reason did you not go to the Amazon? I do. Did I go to the Amazon? Yes, I did go to the Amazon in eastern Ecuador and southeast Peru, as well as northwest Brazil. Even so, the Amazon is so diverse that it was one of my biggest misses at the same time. I probably should have gone to the northeast part of the Amazon basin, particularly Guyana. If I had gone there, I probably could have picked up a few more birds. So if I went back and did it all over again, I could see a few more species. <laughs> Live and learn. Yeah? Who is Ken Kaufman? Oh, good question. Yeah, my book has a foreword by Ken Kaufman. Ken Kaufman is one of the most famous birders in the U.S. because in the 1970s, he had dropped out of high school, and as a 19-year-old, he did one of the first all-out big years, literally hitchhiking around the United States looking for birds for an entire year. And he wrote a memoir called King Bird Highway, looking back on that year, that is an amazing adventure story. I highly recommend if you haven't read King Bird Highway. So to have him write the foreword for this book was quite amazing, I thought, because it was almost like passing on the big year torch. <laughs> Yeah, how did I schedule the flights and the logistics? Before I started, I had an Excel spreadsheet by January 1st with every day of the year, every place I planned to be, who I'd be birding with, and the plane ticket. So I had it pretty much planned in advance, which was good and bad. It meant that I didn't have to worry about logistics on the road too much, but it also meant that I was less flexible than I could have been if I saw all the birds in South America and well, some specific country in four days instead of five days, I had to spend that extra day and just try to scratch up whatever remaining species I could. Um, so I I made the arrangements, but then at the at the end I used a travel agent in San Francisco just to book the flights because uh, stringing together these complex itineraries was a little beyond what I could do on Expedia.com <laughs> and they were able to put together multiple segments into one flight and save me a lot that way. So that worked out really well. Yeah? Uh, the photo you had up there before uh, the speech started uh, was, it looked like something a hummingbird was super long. Oh yes, I did not comment on the opening photo. That was called a sword-billed hummingbird for obvious reasons. They live in the Andes in Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. They have that beak because they feed on those long hanging tubular shaped flowers. But 
My favorite part of the sword-billed hummingbird is not its beak, it's its feet. They have bubblegum pink feet, which I think is really funny for a hummingbird. <laughs> yeah? So, uh, I wonder, when did you start your birding, and, and, and how did that show up for you? How did I get started in birding? Well, I'm from Eugene originally. I went to Oak Hill Elementary School, which is right by Lane Community College on the outskirts of Eugene. And I had a teacher there in fifth grade who put a bird feeder on our classroom window, the kind that suction cups right to the glass. And she'd stop class every time a new bird showed up and make us try to identify it from a backyard bird poster. And all the other kids in the class thought this was about the dumbest thing ever, but for some reason I took to it and I went home and I told my dad, we have to make some birdhouses and put them up, and I think he was kind of surprised, but he went along with it and my parents have always been very supportive of this habit. I suppose they figured that there's worse things your son can be addicted to, and so that's helped me a lot because these days, my whole career is a full-time bird nerd. I work for Birding Magazine as an editor. I go on trips with now with Quark Expeditions to Antarctica and the Arctic part of the year. I write books and I work for magazines and work on research projects in between. And between those things, it's quite a busy career. But that wasn't always clear uh, <laughs> coming ahead. And I think there were moments when they wondered, you know, when is he going to get a real job? <laughs> but it seems to have worked out. So, uh, I have some books here called The Thing with Feathers. If you'd like, come on over and uh, I'd be happy to talk to you if you have any more questions. But uh, thank you so much for having me here today.